Hey folks, and welcome to the Daily Ratings Podcast. It's a show where each week we'll sit down with Vincent Daly to get his thoughts on the latest movies he's been watching, both older films and new releases. And don't worry, there's no spoilers. Vince will give a brief review of the movie, share some thoughts, and of course, then rate the film. The Daily Ratings are always fair, honest, and most importantly, they're consistent. On today's show, Vince will be rating and reviewing... In the Mouth of Madness, directed by John Carpenter, newly released Watcher by Chloe Okuno, Lightyear by Angus McLean, The Black Phone by Scott Dickerson, and finally, Elvis, directed by Baz Luhrmann. So stay tuned and enjoy the show. Mr. Vincent Daly, how's it going, man? Tommy, how's it going? It's going okay for me. Uh, you had quite an in theaters week. Oh yeah, putting in time, putting in work. It's kind of, it's almost like we have weeks now where we'll have three new releases mm-hmm. and then we'll have nothing for weeks at a time. <laughs> for sure, and we're kind of sure. scrounging almost. July's looking spotty like that. For but sure. you, yeah, but you were in the theaters a decent amount this week. Yeah, uh, and uh, I mean, I, I wish it was a better week of movies, uh, not <laughs> not not too stellar, but uh, as always, um, foreshadowing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I am happy to to look at all all types of movies. I mean, you know, we're coming off of a, a real hot week uh, with Crimes of the Future. You know, hey. Uh, <laughs> they, they can't all be winners. Yeah, and I'm definitely curious for a couple of these, too, mm-hmm. just to hear. Um, actually, I want to hear your opinion to see if we should basically go watch them or not. Basically. Sure, sure. Uh, we're going to start back. We have our base. It's our, our only mm-hmm. old film. Mm-hmm. And we, this is 1994. This is In the Mouth of Madness. I don't really know much about it. What do we have with this film, Ben? Uh, so, yeah, uh, In the Mouth of Madness, it's been a while since we tackled John Carpenter. Um, last time we covered the uh, escape duo, ah, uh, yes. which was. <laughs> which was spotty at best. For In the Mouth of Madness, uh, Carpenter in his career is in a little bit of a rough spot. Uh, his movie has, at the time, they're not great. Uh, and, you know, honestly, let an escape from L.A., you know, be representative of that. That's two years later, uh, and he's yeah. definitely in that mode where it's a very, very heavy soundtrack, and uh, yeah, just just not, not the best quality. Very goofy in parts. Um, it was the- bad. It was... 11% of oh, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, for Escape from L.A., absolutely. It, yeah, that's a tro- it's an atrocious <laughs> film. Uh, for, for In the Mouth of Madness, though, uh, I'm pretty positive on this one. Uh, I would say his soundtrack is iconic in a good way. Um, okay. Uh, featuring uh, kind of the usual biting electric guitar he loves to throw into his movies at the time. Uh, In the Mouth of Madness is a full-on horror. I mean, this is... Oh, we're dealing with horror here. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. It is It is uh, a wild horror at that. Uh, really a great example of Lovecraftian or, or cosmic horror. I, I think I can give an ex- explanation of that because this is so you know directly inspired by that. Cosmic horror is always going to be something around the unknowable the creatures are going to be formless and you know even just looking at them you go mad uh that's cosmic horror okay you know what i mean it is yeah, the, yeah, it yeah. is the unknowable is the fear of going insane going mad and in the mouth of madness is almost to the point of being a love letter to love hp uh, lovecraft and a lot of those early works that he had so uh it is not inspired by oddly enough uh, any of the works directly you know the story itself is is something novel uh, it, it is. It, I was impressed with it because hmm. uh, 
you know, when I think of John Carpenter, I think of his creatures of designs in The Thing, uh, and that being the pinnacle of his work. But this film had some had amazing some good... creatures in it, like really scary stuff, which is awesome to see. And how was it? Well, first of all, was this on your radar at all? Uh, so this was a, a leftover from way back when, if you remember, I did that deep dive mm-hmm. into into Cosmic Horror. We covered uh, AM 1200, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The Void, yeah. The Endless, you know, pretty much a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> in it and for some reason I just didn't watch this film it was just kind of a leftover and I was kind of I just got sitting my there filled. on the list basically yeah yeah so I had this one slot this week and I was like what am I going to fill here you know it's always the uh, it's always the, the the challenge of to theme or not to theme the week's episode <laughs> uh, but uh, you know so I, I decided to jump into it my buddy Dave was a big fan of this film uh, oh okay and, cool uh, yeah yeah I, I enjoyed it quite a bit so how does the cast do with this one we've got um, Sam Neill Again, plays the mm. plays the lead role, correct? Yes, uh, Sam is kind of kind of my issue with this film. If oh, I'm being really? Honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, I I would say let me let me introduce some of this. Sam Neill is a private investigator of sorts. When basically a, a prolific author within this story uh, named Sutter Kane goes missing. The publisher sends to track him down. They say, hey, we, we're waiting on a book. What's going on with this? Okay. Sutter Kane's books in this story uh, cause the readers to go insane. Uh, the words themselves seem to take a a certain uh, maddening quality to him. It's uh, referred to his descriptions are almost alien. The realism is is gripping, uh, and there's actually a lot uh, kind of poked fun at with Stephen King. You know, because Stephen King was <laughs> well, there, there was there was this obsession with his his horror novels, of course, uh, right, coming right. out of the time. So this is a almost a, a reverse flip of that. Uh, the insanity is is really put right in front of us, though, because specifically to Sutter Kane's latest novel, his his words, his 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 descriptions are coming alive, uh, and that is what Sam Neill is put in front of. Uh, in the Mouth of Madness, referring to the latest novel from Kane, uh, and him having to deal with the the very nightmarish horror in the yeah. pages coming alive into reality, and that's basically our premise there. So where was he lacking? Was it not only was like was it just basically his his acting overall? Like he uh, yeah. like he wasn't the he wasn't the person who should should have been casted for this role. I, I honestly, my critique with Sam Neill is that I just don't think it's a it's a good performance. Uh, this is, I believe, one year after or just your mm-hmm. next performance, next credit yeah. after Jurassic Park or JP One, as <laughs> we'll <laughs> always know it. Um, I, I maybe his heart wasn't in it. Maybe this was a check for him. Maybe there was. Uh, rumor mill that Carpenter is kind of on his way out in this in this uh, wave of the '90s. So uh, potentially that is hmm. all factors in here. I think his performance uh, for me is is very weak. His his accent shifts around. Uh, sometimes he's trying this like gruff PI almost New Yorker thing. Other times uh, it's just it's just it's primarily British. It's okay. primarily you know uh, his <laughs> you know. Uh, a strong suit for him. I just, I just, I'm very confused by uh, the way he took this, this uh, performance uh, and this character. It's a bit unrealistic as well. Maybe that's fifty fifty with the writing. The character himself is very skeptical, almost to the point of of comedy. How skeptical he is of the nightmare going on around him. You know, we'll we'll be seeing you know some of the craziest stuff like since the thing thing that I've seen on screen. Uh, and you know he'll he'll get to a quiet moment. And he's and he's like, ah, this has got to be an elaborate marketing hoax by the by. The the publisher you know <laughs> it's just like no sam it's not and and this is confusing that you think it is so yeah i think i think he was he was the weaker element for me here okay. unfortunately a little bit of a theme this week uh, is that one or two actors kind of sinking the ship ah. so, yeah but I, I gotta say i mean I, I i was shocked with this film for how far it went with some scares and some scenes like i said we we, we did a deep dive pre pre-podcast folks into cosmic horror and a lot you know to be fair a lot of those films are middle of the road to outright bad you have something good like am 1200 the uh, thing and the thing you like oh the thing absolutely yeah you know the the endless the void uh, but something like color out of space 
kind of just like a straight up bad movie. Yeah. And that's an original Lovecraft story, I believe. Yeah. So I think what's 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 so much praise to this film that I want to give, I mean, it just it just hits such a sweet spot to be its own thing. You know, again, this is not tying to I mean, it's maybe tying to uh, analogies or nods to original works from HP Lovecraft, but it's its own identity and crafts its own story out of this, just clearly being in the theme or the subgenre of this kind of sci-fi horror. Not only that, the creature design work is amazing. I mean, it maybe could be seen as a little bit goofy. Uh, it's not as wow as what we see in The Thing, which, like, The Thing, I just... It, it still has the crown for me, especially for Carpenter. Mm, okay. Because it's just so uh, horrific, and it comes out of nowhere. But this really... I mean, I, I, I was very impressed with the creature work here. Uh, um, was it... How much computer animated? How much of of modeling that they use, or I, I, I'm, practical effects? I'm saying this is probably next to no. I mean, f- uh, ten to five percent computer uh, computer animation. That's good. You know, added I, in, I mean, it, it is mid '90s, so yeah, that's a good yeah. thing. But still, even in the modern day, you know, mm-hmm. 2022 watch, it looks pretty good. Yeah, and, and I'm I believe me, I'm not the the most seasoned with John Carpenter. He has a big big filmography, but uh, I think he's he would definitely be the type to be kind of uh, allergic to that. You know. He's, he's uh, right. with the old ways. Which is what we know? like. <laughs> right, yeah. It really is, If anything, yeah. that's a positive. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think next to Sam Neill, I mean, again, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm real 50-50 on this. It's, it's, it's good design. It's good horror. But it's just that the shoes that we're stepping into for mm-hmm. the horror – are, are a bit tough to relate to. Um, maybe that's also the point uh, in, in a certain way for the story. You know, I mean, this is supposed to be an out there, uh, an out there story that is about the sh- the shift in perspective. Crazy is only a matter of perspective. Mm-hmm. So that, that that's uh, you know a line right from the movie. Uh, so it's very much about maybe that we're seeing it through a certain paradigm and but but you know they would be seeing it as something else or or by acting sane i i would say uh, where in previous John Carpenter films as well, uh, the soundtrack, just as icon- iconic, I don't think it adds too much to this film, uh, which was a bit disappointing, especially okay. when you hear that wailing guitar in the opening <laughs> crawl. It's like, oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> you know, and I was excited, but then it kind of fades out. Okay. So. <laughs> and then for credits, the guitar's back. So uh, Overall, though, I think this film is going to hit for the appreciators of cosmic horror and that kind of style. I am one of them, and I think this film definitely did hit for me, uh, and I think, moreover, lovers of practical effects, this will be a above-average watch for just, once again, not only more of John Carpenter's wonderful work with practical effects, but on top of that, I would say maybe some of his top five uh, among his films okay. as well. Um, but for how horrific the visuals are, uh, this film is just lacking some substance in its plot uh, and its characters and makes it just a, a touch more middle of the road for me. Still a good watch. We're going to go ahead and give In the Mouth of Madness a 63. Okay, 63. That's a good movie. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a good point to make also if you're a fan of this type of stuff. It's definitely – yeah. take some time to watch it. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like so. Was it that well known that once when he got into this time frame of like mid '90s and everything like that, like he was on his way out, like he just wasn't making good products anymore? I, I believe it was uh, related to actually to his bottom line. You know, like his movies were just very simply not performing. Uh, you look also proof in the pudding. You know, I mean, maybe that's hindsight 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean, the the movies here you do not associate with John Carpenter's quality. Uh, or certainly even iconic John Carpenter. I believe the movie before this is They Live, and that's a very de- divisive film of, you know, definitely a cult classic of how much fans love it, but realistically, and I think also on the on the daily ratings, mm-hmm. the, with the site itself, uh, I don't think uh, They Live has a great score, because it, you look at that <laughs> film, and it's kind of a mess, you know? <laughs> so I think, I don't know. We would have to probably do a Carpenter deep dive for me to give a, a, a little bit more of a, you know, uh, educated answer for yeah. that. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But overall, at least that this is still a good pro- it's still a yeah. good film, and mm-hmm. especially if you're into Carpenter films, and if you're into kind of that Cosmic Horror like you like, mm-hmm. definitely a watch for it. And Crack 60s for uh, the fact that it's just it's it's a good so movie. original. It's so, like, right out of the gate. Yeah, it's that's so cool. much horror, you know what I mean? And I, the fact I, that the visuals hold up, too, is like, you yeah. know, I mean, especially for us, it's a big deal. Absolutely. Uh, okay, very good. So 63 for In the Mouth of Madness. Mm-hmm. So we're going to keep it going here. Well, actually... 
Well, we're going to stop and do our I know, yeah, donation we got, segment. We got four, we got new, four movies. new movies. Yeah, yeah. Not much of a donation segment. Uh, we have no. We have no uh, producer. No, yes, we have no producers today, which is, which is all right. We've been on a pretty good streak of people donating, and some people more than you know once, which is awesome, <laughs> which is the best. But yes, folks. So again, we're early on here, and and we're just getting our feet going here. So it's just a time to remind everybody that we are producer supported. So basically, it's a value for value model. Are you getting value from the podcast and you find yourself going to the site as well? If you could, could you give us back some value? You can go to thedailyratings.com, go to the donations tab, and basically through any amount of value you want, any amount of monetary figure that you want to give back to us, we would greatly appreciate it. And that's the thing, you know, uh, we're on here for a little over an hour every week. And we and you have this site there, and hey, if it's just like, hey, this is kind of cool, and you want to give five bucks a month or something like that, sure. your subscription plans or or any anything that you can do uh, is so great. Again, it's, it's entirely producer supported. We don't want to deal with advertising. You know, even as we grow and our numbers go up, we really do want to stay away from it, both on the podcast and the website. Mm-hmm. So any little bit that any little value you can send our way. It's it just so, so meaningful for us. And like we covered last week, you know, even just to interact, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a donation itself. You know, we can we can obviously communicate and uh, and, and get notes from uh, from all of you listeners at home uh, through through email and whatnot. Yeah, it's specifically for the on air element, though. That's that's where the kind of the value. Yeah, value yes, comes in. you go for the value for value. You can write in a note, and we read the note no matter what it's no matter what, and we read it on air. And that's the, that's why we call it the producer segment or the donation segment because it's to um, give. Give a shout out to you if you're mm-hmm. taking time to give us money and taking time to just like go on the site and, and mm-hmm. do that for us. You know, we love that you're getting value and you're giving some back. And you know, we're going to give you a little shout out. Sure. You are legit. It is a legitimate producer credit. And as the podcast grows, hopefully that becomes a bigger deal. <laughs> uh, whether you want to put on a resume yet, you know, I don't, yeah, right. I don't know. You might want to wait a little bit. Not a line item. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so that's kind of how we operate here, folks. I think a lot of uh, l- listeners who, you know, they know that they know the spiel at this point, but for any new people, uh, that's a deal. And if, hey, if you don't have nothing to give, just tell somebody about it. Again, oh, we're, certainly. we're new and we're just trying to spread the word a little bit. Mm-hmm. And once when that website really goes up and running, we're going to, we want to go ahead and hit the ground running as well. But we thank you so much, folks. And, and to all you future producers, we thank you. Again, it's dailyratings.com and the donations tab at the top right. Okay, so our next four movies are in theaters now. This one came out a few weeks ago. Yes. This is called Watcher. Just Watcher. And yeah, and directed by Chloe Okuno, which mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever dealt with her before or seen no, her around, um, seen her name around much. There, there was one thing I looked at the credits, but yeah, no, nothing that I've seen. Uh, yeah, a, a kind of a newish release. It came out early June and I wanted to give it a watch. Uh, and uh, honestly, when it comes to this film, I mean, there's uh, there's not going to be much to it. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be very, very brief here because okay. uh, it's not that the film doesn't have substance in some areas, uh, but there's it's a very straightforward plot. It's an hour and 30 or 30-something 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's, it's like an hour and a half straight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it's, just, it's just very straightforward. Um, the story itself focuses uh, around who she... Uh, was a actress in It Flo- It Follows, a favorite of mine. Uh, I really enjoyed her in that, and it seems that she's still kind of plugging away at being a horror actress. She plays Julia, um, a wife, uh, a former actress. They recently have moved to an Eastern European city. I think it's in Romania or something like that. Okay. When the details of an active killer in the city are discovered... The paranoia that she has builds and builds and builds uh, as the character kind of is lost. Uh, very much a stranger in the in a strange land is the is the theme here, combined with a stalker kind of you know serial killer vibe ah, okay. to it. There is a deep language divide uh, for Julia. I think uh, that's a huge positive here because it does create kind of a feeling of disarray. Uh, There is an intended experience for the audience because there is a huge amount of scenes of characters speaking in a language that has no subtitles uh, and is foreign to our main character, Julia, as well. So we're not supposed to be on the up and up of anything. If anything, a lot of the film is dedicated to... Shots of Julia, she just has a perplexed look on her face, but it's supposed (laughs) to communicate this kind of lost in the woods feeling uh, and knowing that there's something foreboding out there. So does it add to the, so this is just, is this straight horror suspense thriller, basically? I would say, I would say it's almost like a straight thriller. Okay. Uh, I think that's a good way. Does it add to that? Just because you're on the long, you're on the ride with her, like is it is it better that you don't know 
just like her. They're not clued into uh, things. I, the thing is, she the whole film is about paranoia. So her position is that she's thinking about this the entire time. You okay. know, she's thinking that the killer is always around the corner. Uh, and it's more so in the uncertainty of... Um, being able to understand anyone in this country, you know, okay. she's kind of just like stumbling through as a foreigner. Uh, she's she's it, it's adding to this spike in anxiety, this paranoia, and that's and that's really the whole point of the film uh, is is just being not necessarily lost in a city, but definitely not having allies in a city, and and what that could feel like, and that type of almost uh, isolation. Uh, we see this as well in the relationship uh, of the film, uh, her and her husband. Her husband is constantly trying to rationalize and help her, but with her mindset, she this kind of further puts her alone, if you will, in this city. Then. Does does it get exhausting then? Because you're just watching a very paranoid person throughout an hour? <laughs> like, yeah. um, I don't know. I, I I liked it in the sense that I thought there was a really good match of... Uh, mainly because I don't know, I, I kind of related in a way of just being in a foreign city, not knowing the language, and feeling like an asshole. Okay, but in this, it was feeding into her anxiety. So uh, there was there was some realism there. Um, I think the real problem with this film and why it's so simple is like there's not really twists and turns to it. It is an hour thirty that feels like it should have been a TV show. It's just very straightforward. Uh, uh, okay. We we circled the drain on the same premise over and over again. Granted, that anxiety is is growing, it's mounting, in and everything. Yeah, but uh, even oddly enough, I don't even say it that it's. Uh, that it is mounting, you know. There's not even an increased pressure. Uh, there's not. It's it's the same pressure c- consistently. Um, hmm. that, yeah, that's not the most. Uh, I don't know. It's not the most interesting thing to be yeah. captivated by. I guess. Right? Yeah. There's not. There's not hooks. There's not twists. Uh, or anything there's no depth like to that. the film is what it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think what's what's odd is I mean this was a brief runtime. Thank God yeah. because. <laughs> <laughs> If it was any more, I don't know what it would do. And even at that, I I, I feel like this was a TV plot uh, stretched. Uh, could it stretched easily been like a Twilight Zone episode or something like that? It could have been I mean? easily yeah. forty two minutes, Absolutely. or just an hour on Absolutely. HBO Max or something. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. yeah. Uh, on top of that as well, I can't shake the feeling, and and I was was hoping I never had to say this again, but it feels like a COVID production. The the streets of this Romanian city are so. Empty uh, rooms are are so are shot so empty and now is that the is that part of it that she's alone she's paranoid she's freaked out about what's around her I mean yeah I could see that that's how just part of it yeah it does have to play in the theme of that she has no allies right. you know she has no one right. to connect with verbally you know yeah, it seems like it's lower budget uh, too as well yeah so true. you're also just dealing with what you can yeah uh, but I, I feel like there was maybe some 50 50 there yeah that uh, it was uh, it was the idea of it they stretched it out to be this 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 feature length yeah and it didn't need to be yeah exactly so uh, and maybe maybe the the covid feelings I got from that Mm -hmm. maybe that was again just like they had this they wanted to you know make a vehicle to put out in theaters and that's how the production had to go right okay like i said folks i mean just just very simply i mean i I can't really go into too much more because not a lot happens in this film uh it's a bit of a shame uh we're, we're circling the same aspects as the plot I, there, there really isn't much of a cast. There are many <laughs> scenes that are just empty city streets. And I think, again, I walk away with this, I wouldn't say positive, but I think it's it's holding itself up. And I would not call this movie bad because I think there is a serious truth that the film has uh, conveys in its feeling of isolation. Uh, hmm. There is a there is an an artistry, if you will. It is trying to be something, and it is being that thing. Yes, it just happens that it's not that exciting to watch. And for, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> it's maybe you know, hey, that's 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 point one of you know five points in a script or in a screenplay. Right. But, uh, yeah. Uh, the fact that uh, it, it achieves this well is problematic because uh, I think it is worth merit. I just think it's very boring. So uh, I think I think that's a good way to 
to slice it. To, yeah. Yeah. That, it yeah. makes sense. Because like you said, it's not it's not that it's delivering on a bad mm-hmm. thing. And how's he acting in this? Is, is she bringing it down or is it it's it's fine? I think it's good, but it's so minimal. You know what I mean? She has no one to... Well, I mean, there is dialogue in this, but uh, so many characters are just yelling in Romanian or, or oh. whatever the language <laughs> is, you know? So just, it's her just acting paranoid. Yeah, it's yeah, her just acting exactly. freaked out. Okay. So, uh, she thinks she picks up a word here and there and then it feeds into that uh, the, you know, almost like okay. a conspiracy angle sure, of it. Sure, sure. So, it's yeah, it's it's a little tough. I, I would say uh, initially, I was really excited for this hour and thirty minute runtime, and by the end, I was like, "Wow, okay, we maybe could have even trimmed more." So, uh, a single premise of Stalker executed well with some care into setting, but that is just stretched for a whole runtime, and is a shame that it really doesn't have more to offer. We're gonna go ahead and give a Watcher a forty on the dot. Ooh, so maybe don't watch the Watcher. Yeah, I think I think it. Uh, I think it fell short for Yeah, me. for most people, what I mean, what that 40 says is most people can skip this film. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. Um, it's a shame because so many of the films this week, I think, were borderline cases. And uh, for a while, I mean, this film was definitely at least uh, north of 50 mm-hmm. but i just feel like it just it just went on it just compounded in its in its its lack of substance yeah if, if you were around you know 55 an hour mm. probably could have been a lot more exciting absolutely and that's where that and the build up wouldn't, kind of thing yeah comes and the build up wouldn't be so slow yeah. and it would punch a little bit more then sure absolutely. but uh, okay i think a 40 is very representative of exactly what you just said there yeah <laughs> <laughs> um okay so next one big Kind of big blockbuster, but in reality, not really, <laughs> right, is yeah. what it's turning out to be. But this is what I'm most curious about, I would say. I'm actually really excited about Elvis. I don't know about Elvis. <laughs> but uh, this one, again, it's, it's, it's a newly released. This is Lightyear, uh, not with Tim Allen at the helm. And Vin, what do we get? What do we get with Lightyear? It's been, yes. it's been hyped for a while. I mean, it's been it has been trailers uh, for quite some time, right? Disney marketing, absolutely, it is out of the gate. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Chris Evans, of course, replacing yes. Tim Allen. Not that Buzz is the most you know iconic voice, but uh, but yeah, mm, definitely it's a, one of the most iconic voices. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is definitely as a, far a, as a switch. Yeah, right. As far as characters, as far as cartoon characters go. Yeah. I mean, Buzz and but, Woody. Buzz and yeah. Woody. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It it is up there. I, I would say, unfortunately, though, this film is not coming out hot <laughs> for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, this movie was really painfully boring, uh, and I mean, really, that, I mean that from a kid's perspective. Uh, I'll probably men- mention multiple times, but to give some context, folks at home, I went to a theater where it was, I would say, forty to fifty percent full with kids. Yeah, uh, and this theater was dead quiet kids no dead quiet i had more rambun- I, I mean every film was more rambunctious wow that's real that's a bad bad <laughs> the bad elderly sign. and top gun maverick were hooting and <laughs> hollering <laughs> <laughs> that's um that's a bad uh, sign yeah yeah I, I as far as this goes i mean i believe me i'm not just coming out of this hot for no reason or i'm not just coming at this hot for mm-hmm. no reason um uh, you know, as far as sci-fi for kids goes, I'm I'm rooting for those movies. You know, sure, sci-fi yeah, is my yeah. genre, and if if this can I, be a bridge, uh, <laughs> a gateway drug for for science fiction, I mean, absolutely. Well, I'm not only that, it, and that. not only that, it's you know, some people said like we don't need it, we don't need this kind of origin story for Lightyear. Mm. I was kind of about it, sure. And sure. actually, the trailers look kind of good. I wasn't, I was like, I was a fan of it. I had no issues with them doing yeah. this. Yeah. And this is a big Pixar film. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is not... Uh, oddly enough, I think... Uh, uh, well, it's, it's the collaboration of Disney-Pixar. It's where, like, Turning Red is just Pixar, I believe. Or actually, I don't know. No, because Disney owns them. Yeah, They're yeah. all Disney-Pixar at this point. I guess they are. I, I It feels like sometimes Pixar has its own shop uh, on films. Yeah, well, but... we used to have the one a year. Yeah, Pixar used yeah, to do this one, one a year, and now it's multiple. Mm-hmm. But I feel like... I mean, I, maybe this is just me or my, you know, what's being shot at me for advertising-wise, but... Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like Lightyear felt like a much, much bigger movie and a bigger production than sure. than Turning Red. In my um, in my opinion, I, I think in execution it's worse. I but de- definitely as far as what is being built marketing, as, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You and, know, and what it's a, so and, certainly the demographic should be larger as well. I mean, it's like anyone that has even seen Toy Story could. Well, potentially that's what I'm saying, be... and that's why this is the perfect. You said well, that's what got me on this was one. I was totally fine with seeing a Lightyear origin sure. story. I was sure. happy with that, and two. 
your point to a gateway for kids into sci-fi, yeah. which I know that if only you were king for a day. <laughs> um, That's going to be my lobbying but the big thing <laughs> later is every, on in right, life. But everyone knows Toy Story. Yes. People who were now in their mid-30s and like early 40s grew up with Toy Story. Sure, Kids sure. that are only four years old very much know Toy Story. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I just for the fact of – I'm surprised this – the ticket sales weren't there. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's just in proof in the pudding. Uh, like, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, box office numbers has not been hot on it this has, one. It's been garbage. Yeah. I mean, yeah. truly, truly garbage. This yeah. past weekend, it's mm-hmm. only weekend number two. And, and it, you, I don't even, I don't, don't think it hit 20 million. Yeah. Which is bad. If you think from a, like a boardroom perspective too, you, you know, almost the demographic is perfect. You get kids, you get now the millennials have grown up to have kids mm-hmm. and have that tied to it. And then, I mean, that's kind of all you need for like Disney Pixar, you know? It's almost like, how could you mess this up? Yeah, exactly. Well, and let's get into it. You said no laughs from the, from the kids. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, well, as far as this, uh, uh, the opening text here uh, basically pitches that the Andy, the kid in Toy Story, saw this this movie in 1995 and that's what he came home to love Buzz Lightyear with. Uh, First of all, no. This is not a movie from the 90s. It'd be a lot better if it was a movie from the 90s. <laughs> Sci-fi from 95 does not feel like this uh, <laughs> at all. So that that's that's a continuity check right there. Whether it is the kid in the 90s or the kid today, this is a movie boring as shit. <laughs> it's like no kid would be excited by this movie. How do you, you mess know? it? How do you mess this up? Yeah, you have Buzz Lightyear in Space. I know, I know. Uh, hey, what's it lacking? Uh, it, it's lacking uh, charisma from Buzz. Uh, every uh, every joke is uh, this character is more charismatic than Buzz Lightyear, and that's the joke. And it's it's just rinse repeat for the whole runtime. Really, it is it is. So was it a problem? Is it both script and both Chris? Ep- like, would you have? Liked it if it was Tim Allen? I think so. I think people, it would have been a lot better. A lot of people were upset about it. Uh, oddly like a enough. A lot of people were upset about it. I mean, it. I, you know, I, I can't say I'm the biggest Tim Allen fan, but like... Who knew? Yeah, <laughs> who knew? Uh, but I think I think him being a primarily comedic actor... I mean, I don't even know if he acts, you know, in, in anything recently. Right. But him being a primarily comedic actor, I think, would go so much more because Chris Evans is doing... Basically, Captain America won. He's like fish out of water in his own film. And it's like, what is this? And and I'm telling you, uh, don't take my adult word for it. Take the proof in the pudding of in the theaters. These kids were silent. That's unreal. Unreal. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because it's been, I don't know, maybe three or four years since I've gone back and watched the Toy Stories. Sure, sure. And Buzz Lightyear is like he is he. It actually made, like he's funny sometimes because yeah. he's so confident and about mm-hmm. himself, mm-hmm. and it comes off like really right. funny yeah. sometimes. And I think that helps. It's funny talk about acting because it's really just voice acting, mm-hmm. but it does make a difference because when you just have voice, Tim mm-hmm. Allen just his his, his uh, inflection. Yeah, Tim Allen's inflection and just the way he speaks is. It's good, mm-hmm. and it worked for the character so well because it's just it was funny, and you believe the character. Yeah, he's also not afraid to be an idiot, you know. Where yes. this, it's not that 100%. he's an idiot at all. He's just like his heart is too good. I don't know. Last point with the 1995, like that the, the yes. this movie is trying to sell that's 1995. If anything. It's a particular type of failure for me because that is such a cool creative prompt to be like, yeah, this movie's from the 90s. And like, that doesn't show in the execution at all. It could have been really cool. And I'm not saying like Turning Red just in Pixar's shop had that, but at least that uses 90s as inspiration in the execution. There were elements of it, though. Yeah. There were definitely. In the score, and you know. Yeah, no, for sure. There were elements uh, of it. And I I just feel like. So, what do we have? So. Let's get into the movie itself sure, a little bit. Like, sure. what is it about? It, this is Buzz getting his getting his wings, basically. Yeah, right? it's like uh, it's like baby's first theory of relativity. It's <laughs> it's what? like interstellar for kids. What basically? Uh, it's dealing with light speed and the aging that happens, moving faster than light. You know, uh, or, or relativity. This movie's nothing what I thought uh, it was. Then. Yeah, yeah. Wait, let uh, me just say what I thought this was. <laughs> sure, sure. I thought this was Buzz Lightyear going through like the academy and becoming nope. a Lightyear figure, and then like you <laughs> I know, I wish I wish it was more straight laced like that. Honestly, yeah, um, I would kind of believe what you just said. So what is it? It's it's like it's it's dealing with him traveling in space, yeah. and guess what? He comes back to friends, and the friends are older. So it's like it's like a children's version of Theory of Relativity. You know, it's trying to be a uh. children's version of the emotional beats in Interstellar as well. Which is you know what you what I mean? want for a kids' movie. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Just everyone crying. Matthew McConaughey. Just yeah, stressed can you blame out. that? You know, <laughs> baby's first theory of relativity wasn't thrilling the audience <laughs> in the theater. Um, Bummer. The, sto- the story or, or the heart, if you will. You know, I mean, that's going to be you know every Pixar's hook uh, is uh, Buzz basically needs to try to not be as much of a hero. Uh, Buzz is already a legend uh, by the time we're coming into this, so his oh. his arc is not doing everything and leaning on his friends. And I, even in that, I feel it's just like, well, that, does, that, that doesn't really sound like a really sticky hook, you know what I mean? And what are the not... are the friends even good in that? Like, yeah. are you excited to see him? <laughs> you've got the toy bait in there, right? Um, you've got the character that's just supposed to sell toys. Yeah, maybe. The, the cute, isn't that, that that cute friend that he's got? Oh, or the, the cat. cat. Yes. Right. Oh, the, the worst running gag oh, of okay. the whole thing. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my God. But <laughs> that, honestly, the cat did get some laughs out of the theater. So uh, that, that, that was that was the one exception. So It's a shame that Buzz didn't. Yeah, really, in his own he, film. So they, like, tamped down his confidence and his braggadociousness, kind oh, of. Oh, his... exactly, because he's more humble, but he's also, Ugh. like, he's, he's it's, 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 honestly, it's, it's Chris Evans, Captain Captain America, but also early Captain America, that it's all the jokes of fish out of water kind of stuff, and yeah. Uh, the real problem no, thanks. Is, is stripping away cool aspects from this character. It, you know, he, he, Buzz Lightyear has laser wrists, he has jet wings, you know, these staples of why Buzz Lightyear is a cool character, no less a cool toy that Andy would want to buy in 1995, right. <laughs> uh, is, the, you know, these concepts, they show up way too late in the film, and more importantly, they actually don't look like Buzz Lightyear either you know what I mean uh, it's just it's just way too late to the punch as far as bad guys go we have Zerg which was a cartoony or I should say a more cartoony oh, version right. of of Darth Vader you know right I do remember and yeah. uh, and and just like it's so bland you know all of the visual design of the robots and Zerg it looks like leftover assets from Wally. Um, it's just very uninspired, and I'm and listen. I'm not saying like I was so ecstatic for Zerg, but it's just like it looks boring. You know, what I mean, I think again, my perspective here is a kid will find that boring as well, uh, because they're going to see everything coming at them from you know, uh, what, you know, Fortnite, any mm-hmm, kind of video mm-hmm. game, any kind of other you know animation that they're dealing with, and I think this this gets lost in the shuffle even from a kid's eyes. And like I said, it is just not funny. Which uh, is ridiculous. Yeah. Every joke is uh, a character being more charismatic than Buzz. Uh, and uh, the problem with that is that gags around other characters talking run way too long. Like, just characters are just way too... They're, they're, there's just way too much dominance. There's way too much real estate in the script that is Buzz is just not talking. And it's like, I don't care. You want to see Buzz on yeah. screen being... Funny, being good, yeah. and being yeah, being being. It reminded me of what the problem with Black Widow was that uh, in her hmm. own film she took the. Back oh, seat. that's right. You did say that a lot. Uh, yeah, and Buzz, hell, even es- Doctor Strange, especially kind of the same. Thing, oh yeah, especially I mean? because of the character that Buzz is, which mm-hmm. is again, he's a larger than life figure. That's yeah. what he looks at himself exactly. at. It's just like I know that's annoying. Yeah, yeah. And it's what's funny is I would just surprise. I'm just surprised that the box office wasn't bigger for this film because people mm-hmm. at least have to go to figure it out. It's bad. Yeah, because I'm yeah. not hearing the most negative press about it. The thing is, no. I'm just not hearing much about it. Yeah, yeah. It's getting lost and and definitely to Disney's mis- uh, dismay because their <laughs> their marketing dollars are not being you know effective in, in penetrating oh that, my gosh you know, yeah and there's multiple reasons why people say it's bad of course there's political bends to it why people say it's failing <laughs> right. there's all kinds of things sure, people sure. are upset about the tim allen thing or at least the older generation yep, is yeah by the way did he sound at all like tim allen like did he change his voice enough uh, so like when he does certain lines like you're mocking me or something mm-hmm. like that you know he's doing his best to but he definitely sounds like chris evans okay you know uh, like he's too infinity and beyond did he like yeah i mean yeah, it's it's like okay. it's like uh, sappy emotional, you know what I mean? It's it's not, you know, yeah, it's 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 not good. It's not Why good. would they go through, you know, the, I know. you know there was meetings and meetings oh, for, for sure. months on this before sure. even like for anything was for actually sure. set. I know. And and it's just like Where's the creative God team? Help what them what is going on with the creative team at Pixar? <laughs> God help them if they try to do a Woody Western, you know what I mean? To think about Oh my gosh. Yeah, to uh. think about the pilot, you know, of that. <laughs> that's that's straight to Disney Plus, folks. <laughs> they're, not, they're not bothering with the theater. Um but yeah, I, I would say this film is very plainly in the discount bin for Pixar. Uh the director did Finding Dory, which I think illustrates the scope of this film perfectly. That ah. it's afterthought. Uh it is 
I, if I want to be harsh, cash grab, but I, I think this is a touch above cash grab because as with all of this, you know, as 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 rough as I'm coming out with this critique, uh, do not let me distract that there is a you know a tireless army of animators behind this, and uh, I, oh it makes my gosh, me, it makes me as uh, you know empathetic because it's like, well, you know, <laughs> they certainly didn't want to make a bad movie. Yeah, no, uh, for sure, they didn't want to make something soulless. You yeah, know, these are, these are the best of the best over at Pixar. So, and I'm sure it looked beautiful. Like I'm sure the I'm animation sure, was yeah. good, but uh, a I mean, muddy, a muddy in visuals. It's a very it's boring be. looking film. I I would say boring is the is the is the line. You bummer, know? <laughs> big old bummer on this film. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I also think uh, there is a little bit of a failure to understand demographics of this film, like we talked about already. I mean, I think uh, it, this could be a home run for just how many slots it fits in. Whether you're nostalgic, I'm sorry, to but Toy Story you could have had not. probably five better stories than that. Yeah. And this movie could have been incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. If not incredible, like oh, really enjoyable. Yeah. 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 Uh, and enjoyable for many different audiences. Instead, mind-bogglingly, it really doesn't feel enjoyable for any audience. And that's where I say this is, you know, who is this movie for? At least Turning Red was good for little girls. Oh, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, you know? Uh, this one, it's just like, oh, okay. Uh, it, it was it was real rough. Uh, wow. Seriously, though, I would say don't bother unless you, bother unless you need. Don't bother with it. Don't bother <laughs> unless you need some kid fodder for your, for your ears uh, and... Uh, and to bore a rowdy theater to sleep, we're going to go ahead and give Lightyear a 30 on the dot. Oh, my God. I could tell you what. Yeah. I could not. The only reason why it's like, okay, I can see it is because I know how bad it's doing in theaters. Sure, yeah, yeah. But it still completely shocks me. Yeah, yeah. 30% uh, and, and, for bum Lightyear. <laughs> Nice, nice. Unbelievable, though. How, and also, how upsetting is that? That picture? you know, it, listen. Go ahead, yeah. I, I hope the Woody <laughs> Westerns better because I was Team Lightyear. You know, I'm the sci-fi guy. And I'm, the, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying this is bad. I mean, who knows where the westerns? Can you imagine go? if they made a Woody Western? I, I think it would have been cool. They would cut them like a train heist. That that would be exciting for kids. <laughs> what he's gonna do a train heist oh, he's, or is he like the sheriff oh, oh no he's he would the be the sheriff yeah so what he would be saying? he would be stopping this oh, absolutely it would just be rango reach for the sky yeah ha- <laughs> <laughs> whatever he's what a- <laughs> wow a 30 percent for light year wow what a mediocre day we're having oh here. yeah unfortunately it was, like it was last supposed I said. to be this big movie it was supposed mm-hmm. to be this big i was like i said i was excited for it mm-hmm. most people i talked to weren't i i don't know I, okay all right 30 percent makes complete <laughs> sense you know, I, I think if it's on, it's one of those it's, things. It's one of those things. It's da- bound, you know, bound to be on Disney Plus eventually. It's you know? shocking, but it's so telling that you were in, a, in a, yeah. dozens of kids. Not I was laughing. almost thanking myself for being in that theater because I could have really ripped this film a new one, but I think it was cemented oh. because of a kid reaction. Yes, you know, what I mean, was not there. Basically. Yeah, so they were they were my market test, <laughs> which I was thankful for all. Of them. They're they're the producers of this episode. <laughs> um, okay, so. With 30% for light year. Boy, oh boy, not good. Yeah. Let's see if we can turn it around, though. All right, so we're going to keep it going. This is new release. This is The Black Phone. Mm. And what do we have with this? This is Ethan Hawke here. <laughs> Your boy. You didn't say it. He's You're... our boy. That's yeah. why. No, here's the thing with Ethan Hawke. We're just rooting for him. <laughs> yes. yes. I sw- I've seen him in some movies, and he's just like, he's got the look. He's from Texas. He still lives in Texas, so he's got this grittiness to him. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I like him, but... But we're well, rooting course, for him. Yeah, I mean, I, if we really wanted to do it, he has that uh, sunset before sunrise sunset series. Uh, that's supposedly his like his you know his masterwork. So what? yeah, yeah, it's like a romance thing that he a TV did. series. No, uh, a, a series of movies. I think it's like three or four movies. Yeah. Ugh. So <laughs> it's like too much, too much time. Yeah. Anyway, pass it on to you, Vin. So the <laughs> uh, so the black phone. What do we have with this? Vin? Uh, so yeah, this is by director Scott Scott Derrickson, uh, and honestly, his return. He has done Sinister. He has done Excellent Exorcism of Emily Rose, and the last thing he did was the original Doctor Strange, um, and that kind of oh. put him to bed for a little bit. <laughs> okay. Dealing with Marvel, Ethan Hawke plays a kidnapper called. The Grabber, uh, and he is defined by a devil mask and black balloons. Uh, we see his menace through the eyes of children uh, that are his victims and trying to escape his clutches. It's pretty simple stuff here. Uh, not in a terrible way, though. Yeah, not in a- 
there is a interesting 70s timepiece here. The setting is in the 70s. Uh, we have a lot of cool aspects that add flavor to the film. Okay. Uh, you know, kids are always playing pinball machines. There's only glass Coke bottles. Everyone's got moppy hair. It gets the atmosphere. It gets, yeah. Yeah, okay. It puts you in the time period pretty well. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Uh, I, I think, I think uh, a little bit of why it was just middle of the road, not necessarily bad mm-hmm. uh, on this. I don't think there's really any... There's maybe not any, but there's there's not too much substance to why this story is told in the '70s, other than to give style, choose some obviously soundtrack of the time, mm-hmm. uh, and and maybe you know again for the for the visual flair of it. Uh, where I was hoping it'd be a little bit more key is that when you're thinking about a kidnapping story, folks. You, the, the big plot hole is cell phones, you know. Uh, cell phones break a lot of kidnapping stories, you know, or the, okay. the availability of phones. So I was initially excited by it being set in the 70s. Guess what? That's no longer a factor. You right, I mean? right. We're, we're bare bones, basically. Yeah, definitely. That does definitely t- tie into the black phone itself. Uh, the black phone is a phone in uh, the grabber's um you know uh layer layer dungeon yeah <laughs> coming right off a of light year you know yeah. <laughs> uh but yeah um it's a, it's a half step because i think there's praise to say hey i have this kidnapping story let's go ahead and set it in time that we don't have these plot holes i like that care mm-hmm. at the same time i don't think there's much substance to the setting being in the 70s so oh really um, yeah yeah i don't uh it's 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 just a lot of style it's not bad okay but i just don't think there's substance there you know okay just all style so when it comes to our two leads uh we are following a brother and sister uh played by mason thames and madeline mcgraw respectively the sister i would say is an exception here as she is she she has a a large supporting role i think uh this 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 supporting role is is really important to how fun the movie is because it's it's a pretty dark thriller and it's a it's okay. a it's a kidnapping thriller around kids not exactly a good time and obviously it's meant to be a horror thriller yeah, so yeah. that's fine but she provides some well needed comic relief just by having kind of a sailor mouth and it it, it really is oh she's fun she's yeah. a fun character. Exactly, exactly. So, and is it good? It's good acting. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would say. I'm surprised so. I haven't heard one bad thing yet about the kid acting. No. <laughs> well, that's that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> just wait. Yeah, just wait. Uh, I think what holds the film back for me. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, is just how much of a focus it is on kids. Yes, there's a certain. T- I don't know, boogeyman quality to uh, the fact that, I mean, we're all kids. We're all scared of the dark at one point. You know what I mean? Uh, don't don't follow strangers, you know, stranger mm-hmm. danger kind of stuff. So I think there's an electricity to the idea of, of setting this with kids. My direct criticism is just there's not enough terror, especially around Mason themes. It takes so long for us to get a what feels like a genuine reaction uh, out of him. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, it comes eventually uh, for the climax of the film, but for so too slow. long. Yeah, it's, it's just, just too like, slow. is this kid all right? Is this kid, it would almost be right. a question like, is this kid all right with this? Like, does he want to be kidnapped? Does he want to escape home? Because there's like this, you know, they have like a drunker dad and things like that. Uh, you know, it's okay. very 70s that way. Okay. So it's, it's just ma- uh, missing some engagement and really everyone except uh, the, the, the sister is just lacking. It's just it's it's not there. Ethan Hawk. Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> Ethan is good. Oh, Ethan oh, he is, is good. good. Yes. Oh wow. Oh, okay, uh, all right. So Ethan Hawk plays, I would say, a pretty electric villain here. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's um, a, a very little is given it. to us. <laughs> he was ruined for it. Uh, very little is given to us with how or or rather why his his criminal methodology is around these balloons and these masks i will say uh, um a slight criticism and it feels a little bit derivative of split in the sense that we have Hmm. a thriller kidnapping scenario and the villain has kind of these multiple personalities uh in the grabber's sense in this film these personalities are related related to different masks or different kind of orientations of the devil mask he wears and that leads into hmm, okay. different personas. Um, like I said, it's not terrible that it's copying Split because, frankly, Split wasn't necessarily a perfect film. So you know, well, that is just like okay. I mean, you're dealing with a psychopath, mm-hmm. so he's sure. acting psychotic. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so a- as far as 
us not maybe giving given some substantial evidence of why he acts this way, mm-hmm. I think is a good and a bad thing. Definitely pulls me in two directions. One, or maybe maybe just as a positive, honestly, now saying it. We don't find out too much about it, but I was really craving more information for that. Okay, gotcha. Uh, at the same time, it adds to his menacingness. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe now even saying it out loud, that's probably just a pure po- positive because horror is about lack of information. And overall, he was menacing. Oh, yeah. And, and, and we really don't know his his deal you know right right uh, and maybe so. that is good maybe that adds to yeah. it completely yeah yeah the story as a whole like i said feels a, a tiny bit derivative of split as far as just that again that is almost escape room thriller okay uh, a, a, a what it what it was what is pitched as uh but uh the the kidnapping c- scenario i think my my biggest praise here is actually the use of items items that are given to our main kid lead they are so stand out um you can almost feel them in bold on the screenplay and i like that it's almost like playing a video game <laughs> right. you got a yeah. weapon in the room or something yeah it's yeah. like resident evil or something right. like it is a key item <laughs> yeah. in your inventory yeah. you know um i did enjoy it because i think it added a lot of problem solving you know oh, okay we, we get down into the business i'm saying to my Myself, okay, uh, I'm already not too hot on these kids. I'm definitely not hot on on this this you know the, the main kid actor. How is he going to engage with the plot? And I actually really enjoyed the problem solving that happens. And once again, escape room esque type of writing of this kidnapping story. So uh, I think all of this though is um, is fighting for a lot of praise in a in a pretty middle of the road film. I won't say mundane. My note says mundane. I think that's a little harsh. Okay, because there is something. It, it there's there's punchiness to this film it yes. does punch in a way yes yeah I, I was just hoping a li- at least for a little bit more okay uh, and i think what is illustrative here is that it, this is a blumhouse production blumhouse you're not the biggest fan of not the biggest fan of but also their pro their the production quality is all over the map oh so okay right it, it's it, I, can, I even even from me not being a fan of their productions i can't say as a blanket statement you see blumhouse stay away okay you do get some gems get out Perfect example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, very true. So that there, there's there's a little bit pulling me in both directions. I think, thankfully, this does hit a benchmark for me, but not by much. We're gonna go ahead and give the Black Phone a sixty-one. Okay, sixty-one, good movie. Yeah, definitely uh, peaks over it, uh, but. Uh, once again, it's uh, there, there's a lot fighting it, fighting it back. Yeah, uh, as far as my, I think that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And good for Ethan. Good for Ethan Hawke. Good for. Ethan. You know what's funny is uh, I was just watching Valerian the other night. Oh. It truly, I just I a can't believe how bad movie. it is. It's yeah, shocking yeah. how bad how bad the acting is in that. Oh yeah. But Ethan Hawke is in it Wait, for like not very. He plays like the <laughs> the brothel in. owner. <laughs> really? Who's like who has captive uh, Rihanna? Oh okay. But okay. anyway, so. But he was in a Western with that same guy. Oh, really? Who's local to us. Yes, yes. Uh, um, but he would, they were in a Western together where he mm-hmm. plays Billy the Kid. He's oh, way better in that film. Ethan really? Hawke plays like a great character. Chris Pratt plays the bad guy. Almost unrecognizable. What? You can't even... Like, and this isn't the I, Magnificent I forgot, Seven I didn't remake? Even, no, no. I didn't even know it was Chris Pratt, wow, actually, at wow. first. Because he plays actually a pretty decent bad That's guy. That's pretty Maybe we'll throw it on the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it's all, it's all connecting. Yeah. Now we're going to go ahead. I would say this is the biggest kind of new release lately, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. after light year of, uh, sure. of last week. This is the one that just came out in theaters. This is Elvis. Sure. And what do we have with the biopic, Vin? So, yeah, um, uh, as far as the director, Baz Luhrmann, uh, as a director and writer, has some serious style here. Uh, if you know his films, uh, or, or rather I should say if you don't know his films, mm-hmm. uh, we're talking Moulin Rouge, talking Great Gatsby, uh, and then even his first uh, his first feature is uh, the Romeo and Julio of uh, Romeo and Julio. Wow, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet <laughs> remake uh, with Leo, um, which is very stylized. Um, well, all every all the movies you just mentioned, extreme, especially Mulan, re- extremely stylized. Yes, yeah, yeah, big time. Uh, I would say uh, Great a lot Gatsby, of color, a lot of saturation on color. Yes, comes yep. to mind. Mm, yeah. Huge soundtrack. You mm-hmm. know, uh, and I would say Great Gatsby is is the one I I would tune in to just because there is a lot of mix of score, uh, original songs, and then new music as well into it. And uh, I would say that musical flair is very much in the DNA of Elvis as well. So a cookie cutter biopic 
this is not. Okay. Uh, and I was initially pretty happy with that. Okay. I was looking at this film. I was like, wow. I mean, thank God I don't have to just sit through, you know, a by the numbers type of thing. Uh, I was really dreading that it would just be by the numbers. And this movie a, couldn't a, be the farthest from that. Right. A little so. basic for that reason, but it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I want to give credit right off the back that if you're looking for something that uh, maybe breaks the mold a little bit, and certainly how we should all try to support uh, so Hollywood doesn't feed us the same meal every time, right. uh, this is something that is absolutely the director's style. Uh, we'll put a pin in the music itself for now. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that makes me nervous hearing that, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Especially knowing because I wasn't the biggest fan of The Great Cassidy. <laughs> sure. You're right, right. Uh, let's talk about the story. Uh, Elvis's manager is set up to be the bad guy of this film, uh, both in like the history of yeah, Elvis. And he was in real life. So, sure, yeah. sure. This film is is kind of shown through his deathbed narration. Um, hmm. uh, the events jump around all over Elvis's life. Uh, I would say right off the back, what's, what's tough for me is that Elvis has a long career, and I was really excited to see how the many lows of Elvis's career. You were excited uh, to see Fat Elvis. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the conflict of the story feels very fabricated. Uh, it's 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 almost cartoonish of how it crops up. A great example of this are the the many low points actually in the history of Elvis's career, but instead we don't see him stumble. We said the we see the conflict tied to instead social events uh, like the assassination of Martin Luther King, mm. JFK, or, or no, not JFK. It's his uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, and, and and tied into that, then that kind of gets wrapped up together in him having a low, and guess what? Now that. That's the conflict. Uh, it's it's odd uh, because I would really. I mean, there was enough if, there in real life, exactly for him personally. Yeah, I think if um, you know if if they definitely. I mean, obviously Elvis is a massive star during the the time of these events. Certainly, he has a commentary as any pop star would, even in modern day. Mm-hmm, right, uh, but to it's it's almost formulaic in the sense that every time we're having a low, instead of us focusing on the low, we're focusing on these social events, and it's just like. I, I kind of want to focus on Elvis. I mean, I'm not saying For it's not sure. important at all. Right, but right. I want. I'm kind of. It's the Elvis <laughs> story. So um, a, a little bit, a little bit tough. I, I would say definitely as far as that distraction of what Elvis. You know, this is the mm-hmm. Elvis movie. Yeah, it's called Elvis. That's it's it. called Elvis. <laughs> you know, there's nothing else. Not Elvis and others. Uh, Tom Hanks is real bad. Here. Yeah, um, yeah. I was his con- narration. Was a big concern. Is so heavy handed and he does this accent work that is supposed to be like this I don't know, like old timey. Like, well, it's uh, supposed to be the guy. Yeah. I would say easily double hammy versus the guy. And I and I did a lot of post research because I was like Did I mean, he sound if, like this? If, if if this is the guy, like it's a pure pass. You right. Know I mean, if this guy was this much of a character, it's a pure pass. Right. And I would have to rewrite a lot. You right. know? <laughs> but I, I was looking up videos, and I mean, he definitely sounds a, he sounds like old timey like that. You know, mm-hmm. he's a carny uh, at, at, at the beginning. And uh, this this um, I forget the guy's name. Uh, uh, Tom Parker. Thank you, Colonel Tom Parker. Yeah. Sure, yes, Colonel Tom Parker. So I mean, he's he's clearly a character in real life, but Tom uh, he takes it so to an extreme. It's like an Eastern. European type yeah. accent, right? Uh, but Did then the guy also have a little that? bit like, um, yes, and and that's maybe the the root of it. Uh, there's specifically one interview later on in life uh, uh, that he, he because this guy was was shady. He wasn't yeah, yeah. trying to do interviews. For, oh, you know absolutely, I mean? yeah. He's trying to stay out of light. So and there and there's one specifically that he's addressing some of the controversies. I think this is post Elvis death mm-hmm. and. I mean, he remotely, or rather, Tom Hanks remotely sounds like him, but it's like. To eleven, I mean, it's this, too much. He's, it's too much, and I think the combination here is that Tom Hanks gets the narration over this. So even in the cool moments that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing Elvis on screen. Yeah, you're just hearing him constantly, and you're hearing this way too cartoonish much. accent, this cartoonish work. Uh, I, I mean, and is that much dialogue? Was it even necessary for ex- for for explanations or continuing yeah. story? I mean, it's certainly the story that he is uh, a scumbag and he's screwing over Elvis right, for his entire right. career. You know, so but I feel like bad accent or or, or not, mm-hmm. I, it would be annoying to constantly have narration. Yeah, you really got to pick where you put it in. Yeah, I agree. You know, I agree. And the really so the only 
only bit time of a it takes whammy a back seat is when we're focusing on these assassination kind of sub spikes in in the conflict, you know, in the plot. Uh, which is, I think, my problem with it again, it just ties to the fact that why is that the conflict in Elvis's life versus his own career? You know, what I mean, oh, big time. Uh, and and then and then Hanks doesn't doesn't add to it. Uh, honestly, I I don't mean to be too mean to Tom Hanks, but I was dreading any time this narration was coming. Yeah, back on that's right. Yeah. Honestly, watching the trailers, which I'm yeah. glad you stayed away from. Yeah. Um, just in general, you stay away from him. Yeah. But it's just like, I did not have good vibes yeah. about his acting on this I, one. I, I liked his the menace of the character. I obviously like the story of uh, of how yeah. evil, how much yeah. of a scumbag this guy was. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, man, uh, it was, uh, it was it's knocking down it a few pegs for me, unfortunately. Luckily, yeah. Austin Butler as Elvis is amazing. Good. I okay. think he is... Uh, an, an amazing cool performance. Shit, uh, like. He really is. Yeah. And he's being referred to as this new kid on the block. You got to understand, he has like 30 plus credits uh, to really? his name. Because yeah, I didn't see I thought, actor for okay. a long time. And Anything notable that we actor? would know. Like it's smaller stuff then, because I didn't. Smaller stuff, really but a know working him. actor. You know, he's been in 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 a lot of a lot. Well, of he's movies. late. I think he's late twenties. Mm-hmm. So if he's a kid actor, that's plenty of time. You sure, know? it's not sure. like he's twenty one or something yeah. like that. But but I bring up this 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 maybe this working actor vibe to it because you can tell he's really trying. You know, uh, and succeeding. But as yeah, well. it's not, yeah. not. Yeah, it's not coming <laughs> off corny or anything. <laughs> right, right. He's not. He's not failing in this. Uh, I think he is. I mean, just killing it as far as the delivery with Elvis, specifically Elvis with emotion, because, I mean, I can't say we've ever seen Elvis cry on, on like, an interview or something like that. You know, I don't think there's every right. like, big emotion beats. So when that emotion comes, I mean, that's where it's unventured territory, and that's where him as an actor is connecting the dots for us uh, as in the audience. I like that. I think he's doing a great job with it. Um, so much of his acting is also showing Showing that Elvis works in his career on instinct and feeling. Another standout that plays into Austin Butler selling this persona is the costume work here. Uh, it is a standout. Good. Uh, I would say an easy come award season, an easy wrap up just because. I mean, the king himself had a massive wardrobe, you know, and so much of this is shown in a quick way. We don't even get full scenes or songs with a with a costume, but we're flashing in between different costumes. All of them are stunning and all of them are undeniably Elvis. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, uh, I think it's a it's a good one to punch because the realism to Elvis's history Austin's performance and costume work, that is where this movie really, really works. Uh, and I, I can't that, be that's enough of the praise. That's very good to hear, yeah. especially because it's Elvis. You know, yeah. It's just a shame that Tom Hanks brings it down. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's good to hear that he crushes it. It's a shame he's that other it. side of the coin. Good, good for Austin Butler. I mean, yeah. I would love, be interested to see how much research he went into it. But I'm excited to see this movie for for his role, mm-hmm. even when it first kind of got announced. We love Tom Hanks. Yeah. Of course, of course who doesn't? But sure. we love Tom Hanks. I love Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Tom. Like, <laughs> careful, careful. But um, I had no real interest in his role and was afraid of his role bringing right. it down. But Austin right. Butler just, it looked cool. Yeah, it just looked like. And he- there's almost maybe even like, a, all right, uh, what if what if uh, Tom Hanks is bad? I mean, he's, he's not Elvis. You know what I mean? He's not the title. Exactly right. Um, exactly, yeah. So, I mean, there is, I, I think, I, uh, hopefully, you know, I can illustrate that there is very good here. Uh, it's just unfortunately how much of that is cracked by, I, again, I, I have no idea what Hanks was thinking with this. Uh, it is it is cartoonish, uh, <laughs> but the movie is very cartoonish as well. Why don't we talk about the music? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, with a music biopic, the number one question: Is it dubbed uh, or is it the real actor? Uh, in this, uh, there is a mix. Uh, I, from what I researched, uh, earlier Elvis songs were more heavy on Austin's vocal performance, okay, uh, and infused uh, Elvis's voice, and then the later performances, since they just had such more of an abundance of recordings to play with in kind of an audio sure, engineering absolutely. way yeah. uh, the, uh, the real recordings take the presence and then you know Austin is more so just act was it pretty flawless uh, yeah and I fluid. would say so you, okay yeah I, I mean uh, like uh, this director's music style and how how much gimmicky his music style mm-hmm. is infusing mm-hmm. new music and whatnot I, I will say his audio engineering team is top notch you okay. know I mean this is a high quality you know soundtrack okay so. gotcha uh, and I think that plays into the audio mixing of Austin's voice and, and Elvis's voice. Okay, good, so, good. 
like I said, though, honestly, two AT uh, Great Gatsby is a, a great lead into this because oh, no. the gimmick is that uh, the songs and the music are interwoven into the score. That I don't mind too much, uh, but there is even some modern music uh, uh, incorporated here. Uh, this includes rapping. This includes elements of the sound that is far removed from the time period. We see this in Great Gatsby with flopper jazz mixed with... with Jay-Z. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I forget who was on that. I think it was Jay-Z. Uh, yeah, yeah. In ways, I look at that, uh, and it's not a Great Gatsby review, but I, I almost make an excuse for that because it was kind of a commentary on the time period period and 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 the you know the roaring 20s uh in this it's i think a particular type of failure because i'm here for elvis i'm not here for anyone else not here for anyone else yeah um i think where it works the worst is when we have an elvis song playing in for a good 20 seconds and then all of a sudden it gets taken over and actually gets faded out these songs when he's performing or when the songs Mm -hmm. are in the background and it's hitting, you mm-hmm. know, and you're enjoying it, and mm-hmm. it's being stripped from you. Uh, it's, a, I don't know if it's ever during a song performance. It's actually just when Elvis is like trying to be cool. That's a shame Background because I music. think his and, own music works. Yeah, oh like my that. god, yeah. <laughs> and then, well, he's got enough of a catalog, yeah. to do to, to do all kinds of different stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's more so the transition music, the background yeah. music. Okay. Yeah. Now, to be fair, much how I can see kind of the artistic intention uh, of of his of his other works, the director here is, you know, obviously there are heavy blues inspiration to mm-hmm. Elvis's music yeah. growing up, um, or, or, or or kind of coming into form. I, I think it it works. In in pieces there's one scene in particular that he is rolling up to like a, a a blues and jazz club and it's just like yeah i don't know he's playing his own song on the radio i don't need this song to be re-edited or remixed to incorporate doja cat or some rapper you know oh what my I mean? God, yeah uh-huh. so it, it's it's just tough because it's like I, i'm not i don't think it's necessarily bad and if anything it's a reverse force gump you know effect I, that I, it is like you know this soundtrack. He this director has a very heavy hand. Like he look, he, it's style you know. and it's his style, but sure. that doesn't mean that it makes it good. Right, exactly. And there's and no for a way music biopic. I think there's a certain stick failure. to the guy's muse. It's Elvis. <laughs> stick to his music. And if and I would say if you want to incorporate any type of different style music, yep. don't go thirty years ahead. Go thirty years behind sure. of all the stuff that Elvis mm-hmm. took yep. basically, mm-hmm. and where all the influence came from. Yeah, that absolutely. would be more interesting. Uh, in the score, there is some. Uh, Corporation of gospel and blues roots, but at okay. the same time, it's 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 always two steps away from not being the real song. And right. I think there's there's a certain dropped ball there on a music biopic that they're not real songs. You know what I mean? Uh-huh, I think even yeah. the remixing in general into the score is a, a little bit unconventional for this. Again, I'm thankful that this is not a cookie cutter film. I think very realistically there could have been reality that I said, hey, you know, this is generic as generic can be. If right. you really love Elvis, go watch it, you know? Right, but... Instead, we get something actually quite polarizing on a, what could have been just a very, you know, <laughs> plug and play type of movie, yeah. you know? You know, the second time this week, I'm kind of scratching my head on who the who the demographic is on this. This music of modern, the modern incorporation of the music. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, the people that are going to see this, this theater is a little bit more elderly. They might have been, you know, they've been not yeah. seeing Elvis, but seeing Elvis on TV or something like that. So when it comes to this, I, I, I think there's, a again, just a little bit of a odd understanding of just who who is this market for? Who is this audience for? You know, because... Certainly, I heard some groans in the theater when this rap music came. <laughs> you know, I mean, just as there should be. Yeah, sure. because here's the thing: because who's the demographic? You can try to make the movie as cool as possible. Mm-hmm. Just like teenagers and people in their twenties aren't going to go see a movie called Elvis. Right. Generally right. speaking, right. you know, not that it's supposed to be this big blockbuster. It's not. It's not mm-hmm. what it's supposed to be. But mm-hmm. know the demographic a yeah. little bit, and mm-hmm. and and that's a shame. But I get it that it's. It is the director. Yes, yeah. it's, it's, that is like, his it's style. It's not surprising at all, right? It right. That just doesn't make it good, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, and it's it's yeah, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I think if anything, if folks at home, if you are are in love uh, with those movies uh, that he's done in the past, um, 
maybe this is all good indicators for you. Uh, and, and, and guess what? Now that is compounding with, you know, the, the very good sides of Austin Butler's acting, the wardrobe, uh, the uh, historical accuracy of yeah, all yeah. this. I think for me, that is very strictly counterbalanced by, uh, I mean, cartoonish acting from Tom <laughs> Hanks. Uh, I, <laughs> I put atrocious there. That's a little bit too harsh. It's not atrocious. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as far as is the, the the grading choices with the music and a little bit of weak conflict throughout. I think that is the the 50-50 pull for me. I, I would say the fact is you are not getting a generic movie at all. This movie has style. This movie has good pacing and is a little bit of a roller coaster in a good way. But I think for critiquing it, the parts that it fails really fails to understand what a music biopic is. <laughs> yeah. um, and if anything, is a little bit more of a musical with Elvis as the as the subject there. That's maybe a little bit of a better uh, you know elevator pitch than saying, okay. oh, this is like Ray or Walk the Line yeah. or Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, you know that's what I mean? a good, that's a, you know what, yeah. that's a great, it's This could be that. farther from those movies, right. honestly. I almost wish it was. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> right. it sounds like it would have been a lot of Austin Butler and just good. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, hey, this is its own thing. It is, it is, it is. Uh, if this uh, is out of theaters and you have a chance to watch it, give it a watch in the sense for Austin Butler's performance performance here because I, I really can't stress how standout it is and really what's knocking it north of middle of the road from me we're gonna go ahead and give elvis a 59 Ooh, couldn't escape the 50s though huh yeah i think that's yeah. specifically where it does not breach the benchmark for yeah me. i think there's too many things sounds like dragging it down yeah hanks's yeah. performance the music and just just that kind of stuff and, and understandably as much good as well it's, right. it's right. really a, a, a pulled in both directions on this one that's a that's a good way to put it, and I'll yeah. tell you what. Looking at this week, it's a lot of this week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, real. you know, I mean, we have a thirty for a light year, but otherwise we have forty. Six, I mean, we're all over the map of yeah. you know, a lower end kind right. of, or right, or just above the middle mid. of the road. Yeah, yeah. which I love. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think that's a great point. That's a great cap on, on Elvis there with a 59. Mm. Uh, Vin, looking at these scores here, is there anything else you'd like to add or are we going to roll credits on? No, I, I think that's good. Mostly uh, as far as, I mean, uh, the in-theater experience, kind of like how you opened it up. Uh, yeah. I was, you know, believe me, writing these reviews, uh, understanding the scores, understanding my enjoyment of the film. I could have easily uh, preferred watching these at home. But in ways, I really do think the theater experience helped. So credit where credit is due. Okay. Awesome, Vin. Vin, thanks for stopping by. We always appreciate the scores. And for folks at home, we're going to run it through one more time here. We have In the Mouth of Madness with a 63%, Watcher with a 40 Lightyear with a 30 The Black Phone with a 61 and Elvis with a 59%. We thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you all next week on the Daily Ratings Podcast. <laughs> If you enjoyed the podcast, if you would, give us a good rating or tell a friend about us. If you're wondering if a film is worth a watch or if you'd just like to see more movie ratings from Vince, be sure to stop by thedailyratings.com where we have our ever-expanding catalog of films. Also, if you found value in the podcast or our site, become a producer and go to the donations tab on thedailyratings.com. You can donate whatever amount of value you feel you received from us. You'll get a producer mention on the next podcast episode, too. We're looking to build this into something large and great, but also be independent from those corporate sponsors. So we greatly appreciate any support from you all. So thanks so much, and we'll see you next time on the Daily Ratings Podcast. <laughs>